that just stirred my heart. And part of it is because that's my boy, amen? Uh, but also, and just using this, guys, uh, for a bit of time tonight, and so if you could help me with that, uh, but also to reflect upon the truth that this is, this is real, folks. Praise God. And by the way, we're all struggling with dry mouth, so that just, it's just, it is what it is, but make a joyful noise is what the Bible says, and so I know that he's a little d- perturbed with that and such, but that's okay. He gave it all his heart, 110%. And praise the Lord um, and things. And so uh, pray for us. We also feel like we're coming down with something. The weather, of course, uh, has a mind of its own. And so pray for strength. Uh, every single church that we're in is different. And of course, also um, climate-wise, things change just coming from Medford, Oregon. So pray for us strength, for strength and for health and for the ability uh, just to be a vessel that God can use. I pray that you've come with no preconceived ideas to these services. I pray that you've not come to be spoon-fed either. I pray that you've come with a heart that is completely empty and void of self. And I pray that you've come desiring to hear from heaven. We need the Lord. I pray tonight that everybody realizes that they need the touch of God. The truth is, the more that we have a relationship with the Lord, the greater we see our need for Him. Um, I believe one of the greatest detriments of the church is a spirit of self-sufficiency. Something that we mentioned this morning, this I'm good mentality. Uh, That's wonderful. That's for so-and-so, but that's not for me. We need all of it. Amen. And there's two types of people who need revival the most. This is not to be belligerent or difficult or contentious, but it's true. My wife and I have seen this all across the country. And again, I'll repeat myself from this morning. We don't claim to know anything. uh, But this is just something that we've observed. If I could share my heart with you, the people who need revival the most many times are one, the ones who don't think they needed to begin with. As soon as I stand behind the pulpit or I sing a song or anything engage in the work of God and I think I'm good, I'm the one in greatest need of the inundation and visitation of the Holy Spirit of God. Personal revival! Something greatly needed. And so I pray that there's nobody here tonight like that. Because if you are, you need the Lord. This was the problem with the church of Laodicea. Oh, I'm I'm fine. Look at us, we're profitable and we're blessed and we have riches and we have this and we seem to be going forward and look at everything around you. But God said, you're filled with blindness. You cannot see because of the scales in your eyes and the calloused spirit that you have and the complacency of your heart that you're actually naked and hungry and poor and blind. You need a touch of visitation. You've kicked me to the curb And you're going through all these religious motions. And by the way, you can engage in a religious activity in the flesh. You realize that tonight. And just because we're engaged, if you will, in church or religious activity does not mean that it's pleasing the Lord. We must be careful of this. And that's a separate message for a different time. Just things and pondering here before we get into this text tonight. Uh, But I believe the second type of people who need revival the most are the ones who have been saved the longest. Because if we're not careful, the wonder wears off. We alluded to this this morning. We discussed this this morning. Uh, Christ, Calvary, even Christmas, all the things that God has done, they can become mundane, average. The miracles of God become a mere series of facts in the Bible. We forget that His mercies are new every morning. His faithfulness is great. His compassions fail not. His love is limitless and His power is immeasurable. We forget about the greatness of God and the grace of God, even the goodness of God. If we're not careful, these things will become old hat. And sure, our lives are driven by duty. But if you're not careful and if the motive is not right, even though we're engaged in the right mechanics, if we don't have the right motive, duty will deteriorate in the life of a Christian. It'll deteriorate to a display. And this is a very dangerous place. Going through the motions... Now, some of the sweetest people that you find, people that are praying for revival, and those who are eager for an outpouring of God and man the Lord to do a work, many times it's found among that generation, found among those people who have been saved the longest. You study revival history, many times it was born out of the heart of young people and the silver saints, man, sometimes even invalids in their 80s, and they couldn't even go to the house of God, but they were burdened for revival, and they wanted to see God do a work, and some even blind and crippled, but yet uh, having a heart's desire for rent heavens as described in Isaiah 64, for there to be a move of God and the place and the community and even the church to be shaken by heaven itself. Many times those who 
desire and are desperate for revival the most are the ones who have been saved the longest. But there is a danger. There is a danger. All of these things becoming commonplace and average and ordinary. May we not lose that sense of awe concerning the Lord. Amen. It's so important. And that's what we see in the life of Paul here in Acts chapter number 26. Acts chapter number 26, I presume that you're in your place there tonight. We're going to read verse number one. The Bible says, Then Agrippa said unto Paul, Thou art permitted to speak for thyself. What was going on in the life of Paul? Paul was following the leadership of the Holy Spirit of God. Though some stood against him and some questioned why he was doing what he was doing and thought it was foolish and it was throwing away his life and his future and his potential, Paul, if you read prior chapters, realized with absolute persuasion the will of God is for me to go back to Israel and go back to Jerusalem. I'm going to obey God rather than men. And I know it may seem foolish in your eyes, but this is what the Lord wants me to do. So we're going forward and we're doing what God would have me to do. Lo and behold, what people were concerned about took place. Doesn't mean that Paul was out of the will of God. Paul was exactly where the Lord wanted him to be. But it's interesting and fascinating as Paul there was in the temple, and you can read in prior chapters uh, that uh, various Jews that knew of him and were desiring to kill him and, and desiring to destroy him, they discovered him there in the temple, and they ganged up on him and began to beat him up right there in the midst of the temple. And the Roman soldiers down the way heard about this commotion and, and this outbreak and this rioting, so they ran down there armed uh, to see what was taking place, and they broke up the mob that had now formed, and, and they find, using our imagination, and I presume this to be the case, case when you get beaten up by all sorts of people you'll be laying on the ground or maybe there's some bruises or some scrapes or a trickle of blood coming from your brow or your corner of your mouth or something's taking place and man they see Paul in a state of distress of course the Romans are not aware of what's going on and they confuse Paul with someone else and so they immediately arrest him and and drag him off to prison and and before before pris, uh, Paul was thrown into prison Paul as you read in the previous chapters uh, begged uh, the Roman captain and said listen listen I'm not who you think I am I'm just but a preacher of the gospel and and I want to share with these people hope and love and grace and mercy and if you would be so kind and before you throw me in prison give me a moment to be able to talk to them about Jesus I'm paraphrasing of course but what's overwhelming concerning that aspect of Paul's testimony leading up to this text is that Paul was willing to go to any lengths necessary to preach the gospel to every creature. Here were people that hated him. And in his flesh, he could have said, let him die and go to hell. That's what they deserve. Oh, we all deserve to die and go to hell. Don't look at me so shocked. Nobody deserves to go to heaven. We all deserve to die and go to hell. But yet in that moment, with a heart, I believe, filled with compassion and the love of Jesus Christ, took advantage of this opportunity to preach unto the multitudes that were following them and jeering him and making fun of him and even blaspheming the name of God, could it be, and cursing these things and hating Paul. Paul then stood and preached and declared the gospel in boldness and in clarity to the mob and the crowd that had gathered and followed them. I'm convicted by that. I don't know if I could have that testimony tonight. If somebody beat me up, robbed me, trying to leave me for dead, I don't know if the next thought on my mind, if I was rescued from that altercation, would be, hey, let me tell you about Jesus. What conviction he had. May the Lord help us tonight even by way of overview. I know we're not in the text and reading all these chapters. You can do that. Uh, hopefully you took up the homework assignment of Luke 16 this afternoon. If not, your things are adding up, all right? Uh, you could, if you wanted to, this is optional, uh, read chapter number 22 to chapter number 26 to get more depth of what was taking place in Paul's life. And uh, even prior, you could read it's wonderful and things. But here we find now Paul is standing before King Agrippa in Acts chapter number 26. And Paul had been thrown into jail. He was lied about. He was falsely accused. He was even taken advantage of by Festus and Felix that were in government and in power there politically. They decided to keep Paul in prison to gain political favor in the eyes of the people. Now, how would you feel about this? If you were falsely accused, if you were lied about, if you were a pawn, if you will, in some political scheme and you're sitting there in prison, not having any opportunity to set the record straight or be able to communicate with someone who could settle this situation, 
I know for Caleb Garraway that I would be getting very upset. Because there's no term to this sentence. You realize it was over two years, right? And he had no idea, okay, I just got to count two years and then I'll finally have an opportunity to stand before King Agrippa. No, he had no idea. This was an open-ended sentence. Now he finally gets this divine appointment to be able to go before King Agrippa and set the matter straight. And what's wonderful here is, as we'll read in a moment, you do not sense bitterness. You do not see frustration. You do not find anger in this in which he's trying to, in the flesh, set the record straight and get the matter settled and then point the finger here and there and everywhere and with a critical tongue uh, try to very distinctively and even divisively share the account of what really took place. No, that's not what happened. Rather, Paul uses it. It's a wonderful opportunity to glorify the Lord. I'm convicted tonight because there's so many things less than this that get me bent out of shape, that get me angry, that get me frustrated, that get me questioning. That get me arguing with God, why have you allowed this to happen to me? Now that we've set the foundation tonight, we can go forward. In Acts 26, verse number 1, then Agrippa said unto Paul, Thou art permitted to speak for thyself. Then Paul stretched forth the hand and answered for himself. Let's read these next four words together in verse number 2. Here we go, 3, 2, 1. I think myself happy. Heavenly Father, we need you tonight. Holy Spirit, I pray that you please have great liberty, even as you did this morning. But Father, we need a a freshness and a newness, Holy Spirit of God, an anointing of thy unction. We ask that you'd please revive us again. Renew, refresh, reignite our hearts. Help us to have the right perspective tonight. That was an emphasis this morning. Even tonight, a similar theme, I believe. I pray that you'd please, your word would have free course, and whatever it is that you desire to do, we are yielded to that, we are open to that. Holy Spirit, I'm just but an earthen vessel. I need you. I pray that you'd please flow through me, speak through me. Speak and minister to the hearts of your dear people, even those who have joined us by way of live stream. I need you. Please speak to me, help me, grow me, even in this time. We do love you. In Jesus Christ's name we pray, amen. Transitioning to this handheld. I think myself happy. I consider myself to be blessed. Yes, life has been spiraling out of control. Yes, things are not going as I would have planned them or predicted them. Yes. These things have transpired in my life, but I'll just be frank, honest with you and open with you and bear my soul to you. Hold on just for a moment. I'm about to say something you're not expecting me to say. And this is not something that I'm putting on. This is not something that I'm just going through the motions because I have to say this because I am a Christian. No, but rather, it has been bottled up for so long. It's something that cannot be stayed. It's something that cannot be silent. It's something that must be let loose out of my heart and through my lips. I just want to set the record straight. I think myself happy. I consider myself to be blessed. What do you mean, Paul? You've been in prison for over two years. That's okay. I think myself happy. I consider myself to be blessed. Wait a second, Paul. You have been taken advantage of your situation. It's been manipulated by those in authority. You know what? That's fine. I think myself happy. I consider myself to be blessed. But but, but Paul, you have every reason to retaliate. uh, And it's uh, every right of you to be bitter and angry at all those who falsely accused you and lied to you and hated you. Stop. I just want to raise my hand right here and set the matter straight. I consider myself to be blessed. I think myself happy. You know what's wonderful is we find something similar in the book of Philippians. And while sitting in a prison cell, Paul's heart was overflowing as he wrote to faithful Christians. And I'll just read it. Uh, Philippians 3.1, finally, my brethren, rejoice in the Lord. This word rejoice, as we find again in Philippians 4.4, rejoice in the Lord always, at all times. 
Not just when it's good. Not just when it's victorious. Not when it's just the triumph in the mountaintop. But rejoice in the Lord always at all times. Again, I say rejoice. This word rejoice means to find joy again. You've lost the joy. You've lost the spizzerinkum. You've lost the spark. You've lost the thrill. You've lost that spiritual pep in the step. That is something inward that affects you uh, outward. It's not something that you're trying to manufacture and put in the outside uh, just to be able to have some strong face and some strong front, even though deep down within, I'm just so discouraged and I'm so depressed. But I, you know, I just got to make sure that I put on the right front so people think that I'm doing okay. No, but rather this is something that cannot be stayed. This is something as we mentioned cannot be silent it's something that you cannot compress and keep with him it's going to explode out of my body rejoice in the lord always and again i say rejoice i like philippians 4 4 you know why i could identify with a verse now it's saying it twice in the same verse he didn't get it the first time so let me repeat myself So many times growing up, that was me. By way of application, son, this is how you do it. Oh, okay. I do it the exact opposite. (laughs) I do it in some other way, and I just didn't get it. And so for those of us who are a little bit of a thicker skull, God in love and in mercy is coming by and saying, rejoice in the Lord always. And again, again, hey, again, don't miss it. I know you're getting it. Again, I say rejoice. Find joy again. It's fascinating there in the Old Testament we find the verse, uh, uh, will you not revive thy people that we may rejoice in thee? Only God can bring revival. Only God can bring a heart filled with joy. Uh, The fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, 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 peace. He was filled with something that only God could give. He was filled with something that the world, by the way, could not take away. He was filled with something that was not of this earth, uh, not of this place, but rather it was from heaven. It was from the very hand and heart of God himself. Uh, And this was something, as we'll see here in a little while, that sustained him. And in spite of the sufferings and the hardships that he was going through God taught him and he understood the need to rejoice the word rejoice means to find joy again have you lost your genuine joy in Christ are you going through the motions down deep within you know your heart I'm not accusing anybody of anything tonight I don't even know why God would have me to preach this message maybe I'm the one that just needs it Maybe there's some in here that you've been going through the motions and what's on your face is not what's in your heart. Oh, tonight I pray that God would break us and that God would help us to see that there are very definite reasons why we can think ourselves happy. And we'll dig from this text here in just a moment. But may the Lord help us to expose the need of repenting in this area if we've grown cold or grown astray. This word rejoice means to be full of cheer, thriving in happiness. We all know tonight that we can have a song in the storm. We can have a joy in the midnight hour. Of course, this was the testimony of Paul and Silas, was it not? They sat there in shackles in the prison dungeon, just doing the will of God, just doing the work of God, preaching the word of God, all these things, but yet they were falsely accused. And I won't go into the story of what took place in Acts 16, but there were men that got upset that they were doing the Lord's work. And so they decided to persecute these two men that were seeking to stay faithful to what God would have them to do. And they found themselves that night in prison. Had every reason to be angry. Had every reason to be frustrated, to be bitter at people, even bitter at God. But no, you find in Acts 16, verse number 23, down to verse number 34, that they broke out and they struck out in glorious songs of praise to Almighty God as their backs were bleeding, as their hands were in stocks and their feet were also bound up. They still had a joy. A national pastor in Vietnam, I read this from the Magazine on Martyrs, Voice of the Martyrs, some time ago. Very convicting publication. By the way, do you realize that the Christian is the most persecuted people group on the planet? Every single six minutes, someone is dying for this book. And all of them, unhesitantly, unflinchingly, die for this book. The same book could it be that we are hesitant to live for. 
A national pastor in Vietnam had spent several torturous years in prison at the hands of the communists. He was jailed for preaching the Bible and salvation through Jesus Christ, rejecting their religion. Though he vividly remembered what he endured with his fellow Christian prisoners, he didn't focus in the article, he didn't focus on that very much. Rather, he spoke often of the times he was overwhelmed with the joy he experienced in the presence of God. He said this, when we were in prison, we sang almost every day because Christ was alive in us. <laughs> we rejoiced in that this morning with that wonderful resurrection song. He lives, he lives. Christ Jesus lives today. Hey, you want to know how and why? He, he lives within my heart. This was something that they had and they rejoiced in. They knew, he continued in the statement, they knew we like to praise God. So they gave every Christian in prison a musical instrument. However, they didn't give us violins or mandolins. These were too expensive. Instead, they put chains on our hands and on our feet. They chained us to add to our griefs, yet when we clanged them together, we could sing, This is the day, clink, clank, of course in Vietnamese. This is the day, clink, clank, which the Lord hath made, which the Lord hath made. And there, in that third world country, underneath oppression through communism, they're shaking those chains and all down the cell block. You can hear it. And here come the guards uh, filled with anger and spewing vulgarities and blasphemies from their mouths, uh, running their batons down the metal bars, threatening them with more beating on their feet and taking pliers and pressing their fingers and ripping out nails doing all sorts of things, but yet the chains kept clanging away. They could not take away their song, even though they took away their freedom. It was something that Jesus gave that could not be stripped or ripped from their bodies. It was joy. Paul's joy. As you think about this text, and we're just kind of jumping into the deep end of the pool with it. Paul's joy didn't come. You read the prior chapters. You read this text. Didn't come from the things around him. The external, if you will. The external sources or circumstances that were ever changing. But rather, Paul's joys, we'll see here in a moment, it came from the eternal source of God. It came from his Savior who would never disappoint him or lead him astray. He didn't allow his situation. He didn't allow his circumstances that were contrary to him. He didn't let these things dictate to him or tell him or convince him what his outlook on life should be. He didn't let these things distract him or cause him to take his eyes off of Jesus. He didn't let these things discourage him or trouble him in his heart with worry and anxiety. Rather, as we'll see here in just a moment, every reason why he found happiness and joy was because it was centered on the Lord. And as a result of the testimony that it gives, it proves and it shows, it demonstrates that during those years of sitting in a prison cell, having no clue when he would have an opportunity just like this. All through the while, he kept his eyes and his mind and his heart stayed upon the Lord, upon God alone. You know, we uh, mentioned that song, This is the Day Which the Lord Hath Made. That's Psalm 118, 24. This is the day that the Lord hath made. We will rejoice and be glad in it. Do you realize that Paul had that verse? Just like we have that verse. A verse such as this teaches us that nothing, there's nothing too sudden that catches God by surprise. God has made the day, and God is sovereign. I'm not a Calvinist, but I believe in sovereignty. It's in the Bible, come on. God is in control. God knows what's going on. And there's so many different things. And there's a web of crossroads and decisions that could be made. And he's given me a free will. But as I stay, as I stay sensitive and yielded to his direction and his leadership, and when something happens, like in the life of Job, when something happens, as in the life of Joseph, when something happens, like in the life of David, when something ha you get the idea? When something happens, hey, this is the day which the Lord hath made. Pause. Stop. Hold on. Right now, right here. This, he's made it. We will rejoice. 
we will find joy again. We will have heart again. We will find happiness again. We will rejoice and be glad in the thick of it, in the midst of it. He had passages such as Jeremiah 32. Jeremiah 32, just listen as I read from verse number 17. The Bible says, Ah, Lord God, behold, thou hast made the heaven and the earth by thy great power and stretched out arm, and there is nothing too hard for thee. He had that principle. He had that promise just like we do. And he understood there's nothing too hard that God cannot handle. He had Isaiah 61 verse number 3 where the Bible teaches us that God desires to appoint people that mourn in Zion to give them and give unto them beauty for ashes. God wants to make beauty out of ashes. He wants to take uh, the oil of joy and give it for mourning. The garment of praise for the spirit of heaviness and all the things that are described there in Isaiah 61. And he understood that there's no one too broken that God cannot mend, strengthen, or heal. There's no trial too trivial that God will not interpose himself with if he's invited to help. As so many things throughout the Old Testament in the book of Psalm is calling out and crying out for the believer to seek the Lord in the darkest of moments. Thank God that God is still God. God of the Bible from generations past, from Genesis 1, and the God of Paul is our God right now. Okay, let's just, let's just hold on, just stop. How are you? Good to see you. My heart is just so focused tonight. Um, you think about the office of the presidency. Every four years, that office can potentially change in America. There might be a tenure for eight years at most nowadays. And then it transitions, it has to change from one being to someone else. That's not the case with our God. He is not elected. He is not appointed by a democracy or a republic. By the angelic host that votes who's going to be the next ruler or king of kings. God is God, period. The same being, I say that with all respect and with dignity tonight and reverence, capital B, or capitalize all the letters in the word. The same being, the same Jehovah that was there in Genesis 1-1 in the beginning. God is the exact same. The office is still the same. The one who fills that office is still the same. His power has not weakened His presence has not withered away over time. You know, he's just simply a mere shadow of what it once was in his former glory. And now, man, you know, he's been after this thing for thousands of years. He's getting tired. And yeah, blow that trumpet. We'll get the show on the road and do the seven years. And all right. No, God is still God. Praise God tonight. There's nothing too hard that he cannot handle or take care of. If we're not careful tonight, I'll speak for myself. If I'm not careful. I will allow the cares and the concerns, even the crises of life, to rob me of my joy. Every day may not be a good day. Let's just set the record straight. But there is still good in every day. And you know, I'm I'm inclined to believe that there's a whole lot more good days than bad ones. And Paul could have easily gotten discouraged and thrown on the towel But he didn't, and we'll see this. This is all foundation. He didn't let the disappointments of life lead to despair. If he did, he wouldn't be saying, I think myself happy in verse number 2 of Acts 26. Rather, he let these things develop a greater perspective of God. A greater pursuit of God. A greater passion for God. All these things will be described in here a moment. And thank the Lord tonight, if Paul could do it, underneath dire circumstances such as these, There's hope for me too. Amen, brother? I also can come forward with a shout, with a song. I also can come forward with the right spirit and the right heart, the right mindset, and say, you know what? Sure, life's been spiraling out of control, but it's going to be okay. I think myself happy. What do we see Paul testifying of here in Acts 26? We could read verse number 2 down to verse number 15, verse number 16. And from this text here, what we see is that Paul decides to not even talk about the situation per se, but rather he decides to share his salvation testimony. And sure, he talks initially about some things, but he uses that as a segue to give his salvation experience to a lost man and even all those that had crammed into that courtroom. You know, I believe tonight one reason why Paul could think himself happy 
is because number one, God saved them. It's real deep preaching, isn't it? But see, sometimes it's the simple things that we forget, and it's the simple things that we need the most. God saved me. God cleansed me. I was the vilest of sinners. I'm the chiefest of sinners. Man, I was a serial killer of Christians. I disguised myself to be one of them, and I was handpicked by the Sanhedrin to go and to figure out where these Christians were meeting, men, women, and children, and figure out where they lived to persecute the church of God, to kill them where they slept, to drag them off to prison, to torture them, to figure out where other Christians lived. This is what Paul did for a living, all underneath the name of religion. Religious zealot, murdering other human beings. Paul had a past, didn't he? Every single day, I believe that when he woke up, he stopped and he realized, that is no longer me. I'm a child of the king. I am saved. I'm one of God's own. My worst day being saved is nothing compared to my best day being lost. And sure, maybe this situation, this circumstance will take my life. Let it be, if that be God's will. For to be absent from the body is to be present with the Lord. For to me to live is Christ. To die is gain. The best is yet to come. I'm a child of the King. If I die from the pain, if I die from the persecution, if I die from prison, so be it. I'm going to heaven. Amen. I'll close my eyes here and I'll open my eyes there and be with the Lord forever. God cleanse me. God cleanse me. God save me. I think about that song that the kids enjoy to sing. I'm so happy. Here's the reason why. Jesus, He took all of my sins away. No longer am I that person who I was before I got saved. But man, I tell you what, God has done a transformative work in my life. I met Jesus in the way. Jesus. Oh, Jesus. Do you know Him today? Please don't turn Him away. Oh, Jesus. That's basically what Paul is doing in the midst of this courtroom. Hey, King Agrippa, I know that you weren't expecting this earful, but I'm going to share with you my heart. Hold on. Just, just hold on. You're probably not going to expect what I'm about to say. It cannot be contained. It cannot be silenced. I think myself happy. And sure, this, that, and the other is taking place, and he just kind of blew over that. Let me tell you what God has done for me. He saved my soul. He's cleansed me. I was the chiefest of sinners, but yet he's done a transformative work in my life through his amazing grace. Could it be that we don't have joy because we've lost the joy of our salvation? It's interesting, it's Psalm 51, I forget the verse, but in Psalm 51, the Bible teaches us, and David is praying, restore unto me the joy of thy salvation. He understood that salvation was not him holding on to Jesus, but Jesus holding on to him. His salvation that I get to be a part of. Thank you, God, for saving me. I don't save myself. God, I realize that I need to be restored in this area. I need to be renewed, refreshed, reignited, revived. I've lost the joy of my salvation. I believe that if we remember what God has done for us so wondrously and gloriously, that there is a name written down in glory in the Lamb's book of life. And one day, with my glorified body, I will see it with my glorified eyes. Caleb, Matthew, Garraway, having trusted in Jesus Christ. Uh, there's a little boy, November 9th, 1994, is when I got saved. I remember that moment when I met Jesus in the way. I know I'm going Going to heaven. I pray that you know that too. And not to pause in a message or delay a message. Far from it. I don't want to do that. I believe at this very moment it is needful for us in this journeying forward to ask the question, are you saved? Do you know for sure that if you were to die right now that you'd go to heaven? Well, I, you know, I, yeah, because you know, my parents said I did something when I was like four is that your salvation testimony tonight? I'm not asking you what your parents told you you supposedly did when you were a child. Because your salvation is not based on an experience they had telling you you supposedly did. It's based on you and the Lord. If there was technology that could, you know, put some sort of wire to my mind and then on the screen, uh, you could see what I was thinking. 
I could right now visualize my experience. Yes, I use the word unashamedly. Experience. Of when I met Christ and got saved. Now, sure, it's not going to be a perfect playback. I mean, it's years ago. I still remember. My salvation, I understand, is not based on my memory. Okay? But it's based on Jesus Christ. But I don't doubt my salvation. I know I'm saved. Maybe someday uh, my mind will fail me. And praise the Lord that just because my mind will fail me, as some do as, as they grow older, it doesn't mean that I suddenly become lost, by the way. We all know that. But not one moment after I got saved have I ever doubted my salvation. Now, there have been times that I didn't feel worthy. <sighs> Man, I shouldn't be saved. Oh, God, who am I? but I've never doubted my salvation. I'm not here to try to get you to doubt your salvation, but I'm here to question your salvation. What? Yes. There's nothing wrong with me asking you, tell me about your salvation. Sometimes when you ask that to young people, especially, um, uh, you know, uh, maybe it's because they weren't expecting the question, or maybe it's a little awkward, and maybe they're not that vocal. Yeah, right. I believe I'm, many times it's because they're not saved. They're trying to make sure that they get their facts straight and their story that they've rehearsed or they've been told. I know my son David struggled with that, didn't you, son? There was one night in West Virginia. <laughs> he trusted Christ as his personal Savior a couple of years ago and got the matter settled. And that was not assurance of salvation. That's when he got saved. Praise God. Have you ever doubted it since? I've never asked you that question publicly, but I'm asking it tonight. He's never like, no, Dad, no, no, no. I mean, he's, I mean, he'll fight you over it. He's saved and he knows it. And sometimes if somebody does hesitate in sharing their testimony, and they're genuinely born again, it's because they're trying to figure out if they're going to give you the long version or the short version. You know, well, I, I, uh, you're either saved or not. You either know it or not. Are you saved? And those of us that have trusted Christ as our personal Savior, could it be that the wonder has worn off? And we alluded to that. Those who have been saved the longest, if we're not careful, we can lose the joy. We need to be revived, refreshed, renewed, reignited. And instead of the yawn, oh, yeah, oh, Jesus did that, and Jesus did this, and here's another, since Jesus came, oh, yeah, oh, wonderful. Oh, no, 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 no. I believe that grieves the Holy Spirit. It breaks God's heart. One of the reasons that Paul could testify, I think myself happy, is because he had a joy that came from his salvation. He never forgot that God saved him, that God cleansed him. And I believe across America that Christians and churches need to get fired up again and happy about what God has done for them, that we don't lose the wonder of his miraculous working in saving our souls. Notice, let's jump. Normally, you know, whenever I preach a message, you just preach right through the text. But if you be willing tonight, jump with me to verse number 22. Verse number 22, Paul testifies this. Having therefore obtained help. Where did he get this help from? God. The only reason I'm even here <laughs> is because of God. Having therefore obtained help of God, I continue unto this day. May I pause and just mention this? You can make it. No matter what it is that you face and all the difficulties that we go through, and every single one of us have had our fair share, maybe some more than others, I don't know. But listen, here's the deal. I'm thankful tonight. Paul said, I made it. I was able to continue. I was able to make it to the other side. And all these, if he could say it, we can say it too. The only way he could continue was the result of having obtained help of God. I'm thankful tonight that God cares for us. And this is the second reason why he could think himself happy. God cleansed me. But number two, God cares for me. As we quoted this morning, Psalm 46, verse number one, just listen. God is our refuge and strength, a very present help in trouble. Therefore, will not we fear, though the earth be removed, and though the mountains be carried in the midst of the sea, though the waters thereof roar and be troubled, though the mountains shake, and with the swelling thereof, Selah. The whole world could be falling apart, but you know what? God's got this. 
He's my refuge. That's where I'm going to run. Not to the arm of flesh and not to the arm of finances. Not to this, that, or the other. But rather I'm going to run straight into the arms of my friend that sticketh closer than a brother. Jesus Christ, he cares for me. I'm going to cast all my care upon him for he cares for me. Psalm 121. It's fascinating. We alluded to that this morning even in the morning service. And there in that chapter, he says this, I will lift up mine eyes into the hills from whence cometh my help. My help cometh from the Lord which made heaven and earth. You know who's got this? And you know who's going to strengthen me and invigorate me and infuse within me that supernatural spizzerinctum to go forward one day at a time, one step at a time? It ain't from this world, and it's not of earthly origins. It is from God in heaven above. The one who spoke the word and everything had its being and form is the exact same one who stands there desiring to help me in my crisis. This is just mind blowing to me. It really is. Praise the Lord. Amen. God is so good. And Paul, and I mean that, man, it just hit me. I think myself, God, you know what? God has helped me. God cares for me. I will lift up mine eyes into the hills from whence cometh my help. My help cometh from the Lord, which made heaven and earth. He will not suffer thy foot to be moved. He that keepeth thee will not slumber. God's not, oh, 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 oh he just fell into a hole. I better help him. Ah. No. God is aware. He that keepeth shall neither slumber nor sleep. The Lord is thy keeper. The Lord is thy shade upon thy right hand. The sun shall not smite thee by day, nor the moon by night. The Lord shall preserve thee from all evil. He shall preserve thy soul. The Lord shall preserve thy going out and thy coming in from this time forth and even forevermore. What a wonderful, comforting text. Psalm 124, verse number 8, for those taking notes. Psalm 124, verse number 8. Our help is in the name of the Lord who made heaven and earth. The Bible says in Psalm 55, I love the verse, Psalm 55, verse number 22, cast thy burden upon the Lord and he shall sustain thee. I would like to do an illustration tonight. I've never done this before. Let's see. Um, brother, would you come on up? All right. And then this young man here, would you come on up? All right. And let's see what we can do. All right. Um, I don't know. This church is pretty clean. Hey, Amen. It's wonderful. There's no two years of gathering in the pulpit. All right. Um, but let's, let's go ahead and use this hymn book. I don't know if this is going to backfire. Let's figure this out together. And they're like, I have no idea what we're doing. Let's just come down here. No, let's go back up here. I'm just joking. Here we are, right here. Okay? You're the guy struggling. Okay? This is the Lord. What, what, have I done something wrong? <laughs> I'm just joking. They're agreeing with you. Oh, no. <laughs> He's struggling underneath this weight that's weighing him down. And the Bible says cast. You know, the word cast is not a formal term. Very dignified, now I will bequeath unto thee my burden. But rather, I'm taking it, I'm stumbling, and I'm tripping and I'm falling. All right, hold on to that. All right, and you stand over here. Let's stand over here. Stand over here. All right, very good. And you're stumbling and you're falling. You've got this weight underneath you. And just be careful not to give him a black eye. You throw it to him. Take it, take it, oh God. And as soon as the, it transpires, he's got his arm and he's got it underneath your sh Here it is. I got you, child. Go ahead, let's try it again. All right, because I kind of walked you through it. All right. And I'm not trying to be silly, but maybe this will give you a picture in your mind. Cast thy burden upon the Lord, and he shall sustain thee. I'm about to fall and collapse. He's got me. He's got me. Okay, go ahead. Here it goes. This is you. This is me. Take it. Take it, oh God. Get out of here. All right, let me try this. Here we go. All right, here it is. Oh God, I've got the burden. I can't go any further. Oh Jesus, take it. Oh God, help me. <laughs> I appreciate it. <laughs> That's what it's talking about. Thank you, gentlemen. You may have a seat. That's what it's talking about. I think myself happy. I consider myself to be blessed. God's cleansed me. I'm a child of the King. My worst day being saved is nothing like my best day being lost. And if this prison kills me, if this peril and persecution kills me, so be it. I'm yielded to that and resigned to that. I wasn't expecting it, but I'm okay with it because God's got this. Come what may, 
I take my final breath here. My exhalation of my soul and spirit leaving my body. Are you listening? <sighs> Immediately follows an inhalation of celestial air. God's claim, God cares for me. And it's not conditional. It's unlimited. It's not conditional. It's unlimited. Machine gun style, I just want to mention these things to you. In such a fast pace that maybe you won't be able to keep up. But consider Christ tonight. He has a heart that loves us. Psalm 33, 11. Hands that will help us. Isaiah 41.10 Eyes that watch over us. 2 Chronicles 16.9 Feet that run unto us. Luke 15.20 A mouth that speaks to us. Deuteronomy 8.8 8. A face that shines upon us. Psalm 42.5 Psalm 67.1 Arms that will carry us as we saw demonstrated. Isaiah 40 verse number 11 uh, A bosom that will embrace us. Same verse, but later in that text of Isaiah 40 verse number 11 Ears that listen to us. Psalm 116 To thoughts that are only good toward us. Only good toward us. Psalm 40 verse number 5. A word that will guide us. Psalm 119 verse number 105. And a life as we all know and as we preached about tonight. A life that was given for us. I think he cares. There should be no doubt in our heart. He loves you. And has your best interest in mind. And lastly tonight. In, Isaiah, uh, in Acts chapter number 26. Notice what the Bible says here in the midst of this chapter in verse number 16. Jesus speaking. Paul sharing it to the crowd, to King Agrippa. The Lord said, but rise. Get up. I know that you got a past. I know that you've had struggles and, and things, but I want you to get up, son. I believe tonight that God does not want His people laying flat on the ground discouraged by their past. And maybe there's people in this room that you have a past. There are things that you've committed you would never want to come to the light of day. He makes the vilest of sinners clean. He wants us to all get up and go on. To rise, to stand, and to go forward. There are so many Christians, God can never use somebody like me. I, you don't know what I've done. We should all feel unworthy. We do not deserve the privilege of living for Christ. But there are some that will have vivid memories coming back in their heart and their mind that will haunt them, and the devil will use that and whisper deceit into their ear, God will never use you. And those things beat you over the head, down into submission unto it, rather than standing and living for Christ in this dark day in America and our community is in desperate need of Christians that have risen just as our Christ has risen and victoriously go forward just as Jesus has victoriously gone forward. The Bible says, let's continue, but rise and stand upon thy feet. Why? For I have appeared unto thee for this purpose, to make thee a minister and a witness. Notice verse number 18, just for the sake of time, jumping down to that verse. I love this verse. One of my favorite verses of the Bible that as you're engaged in this purpose, as you're engaged in being a minister and a witness, I'm going to use you to open their eyes. You realize that people are in blindness tonight. 2 Corinthians 4, that's the chapter reading tomorrow in Family Devotions, by the way, heads up. 2 Corinthians 4 teaches us that Satan hath blinded the minds of them which believe not, lest the light of the glorious gospel of God should appear unto them. God has commanded the light to shine out of darkness. 2 Corinthians 4 talks about, and there are people literally in bondage. They're blinded. They're weighed down with the burdens of sin and all sorts of things that the devil is trying to keep them in that chokehold, if you will. And God wants to use you to come along to open their eyes to see that there is hope in Christ. They can find help at His hand just like we found help. And mercy and grace in that time of need. To open their eyes, to turn them from darkness to light, 
from the power of Satan and the God that they may receive forgiveness of sins and an inheritance among them which are sanctified by faith that is in me. It's talking about heaven and what to look forward to in the life to come. Number three, maybe you've already figured it out. I think myself happy. Why? God's called me. God has a purpose for my life. And God is not done with His purpose for my life until I take my final breath and until I go home to be with the Lord. We quoted the verse in passing tonight, for to me to live is Christ. If you're still alive, God's not done with you yet. Every single day, I presume, because he's given this part of his testimony, of course, through the inspiration of the Holy Spirit, but as he's given this testimony, he shares about his calling, the purpose that God has for his life. This is something that must have consumed him. Something that filled him. To realize that God wanted to use him to make an eternal impact, to make a difference in his generation. And every single time he woke up in a prison cell, put his shackled feet on a floor, Shuffled around that place of bondage. Could it be that he reflected within himself? I don't know. Speculating. But could it be that he reflected within himself? No, I'm not dead yet. God's not done with me. He wouldn't leave me here to rot. We all know that. I'm just going to rejoice. I'm going to wait on the Lord. I'm going to rest in God. God knows what he's doing. I don't understand what he's doing, but you know what? He's got a purpose for all of this. By the way, do you realize that as Paul was in prison during this tenure and at other times in his life, that's when God used him to write the books of the Bible that we read in the New Testament. From that pain came something pure. From that peril and that prison came purpose. But specifically here and in conclusion tonight, with that third thought, I know it's a little out of whack because we went here and then there and then back to the middle, but God cleansed me, God cares for me, but if we could end with this thought tonight, I'm just pressed to the Holy Spirit to do so, I appreciate your sensitivity, to let me just mind the Lord, God called me. I pray tonight that you would apply this to yourself to realize that you have purpose. Every life has divine design, there's no whoops, there's no uh-oh, there's no mistake with God. Your existence is not an accident. But God delights in your life and God wants to use you. You have supernatural, glorious potential in the will of God. And may we not let anything diminish us from this perspective. Let anything keep us from going forward for God and saying, Lord, what is your purpose and what is your plan? Oh God, what is your calling? I want to fulfill it to the nth degree. I don't want to miss out on anything. And if we could borrow from this morning and implement it right here, Titus chapter number two of people that are zealous of good works. There's a passion. There's a radical spirit. There is a red hot fire in which it's all consuming. I want God to use me to the maximum. I want to experience the work of God through my life unleashed. I don't want to leave one stone left unturned, so to speak. But all of it, all of it, God, you've called me. You've created me for a purpose. You've called me. Do you believe tonight that God has a purpose for your life? Have you lost perspective? Do you find joy in the fact that God delights in your life? He has good pleasure, the Bible says, in Philippians 2, in your existence. As a minister, as a witness, that's talking about being a servant and being a soul winner. Servanthood is greatness, church. Be a servant. Well done, thou good and faithful servant. Someone that was not looking out for self-advancement, but someone who was looking out for the advancement of others and ultimately for his Savior, Jesus Christ. Someone that was not looking at others to use them as a stepping stone. But someone that was willing to be that stepping stone for others. Someone who realized it's not about me. It's all about Christ. I don't want people to know my name. I want people to know my God. Here it is. I'll go ahead and get down and step on my shoulders. Take advantage of me. I'm not going to promote or pursue myself or who I am. Oh, God, I want you to just use me. 
Please, oh God. I just want to be a servant. This really is a whole separate message. We understand that for a separate time. And so many thoughts going through my head. I'll mention this, and God is filtering them very distinctly, very clearly, as we now wind down to the invitation. I don't know how much of an impact this will make in your life. I presume it will touch you. It's affected me. Ronald Reagan, who was a born-again Christian, one of our presidents, had two plaques on his desk in the Oval Office during his tenure as commander-in-chief in this country. One of those plaques said this, there's no limit to what a man can do or where he will go if he doesn't mind who gets the credit. Are you a servant tonight? Is your life consumed with not me first, thee first? A minister. The greatest words of commendation leaving the lips of the King of Kings in heaven are what we've quoted a few moments ago. Well done. Ain't possible if you don't do well. Ain't possible if you're not good. We need holiness. And not our definition of it, but what the Bible teaches. And some of us just need to be broken about that. Just swallow our pride and arrogance and get right with God. Good, faithful, faithful. I really, I'm still alive. God's not done with me. I'm going to stay faithful to the finish, my final breath. I'm all in for Jesus Christ. We're not quitting. We're, not throwing, we're staying after it, finishing the course in the race. Amen. Servant. <laughs> Ain't about me. It's about him. How can I be a blessing to others? A witness, a soul winner. We'll get more into that this week. Father, use these truths. A very multifaceted message, a lot of things. Lord, I have not paid attention to the clock. Thank you for people that are sensitive to, to join with me in that and, and not really focus on the time. I literally have no clue. I don't even know where I left my phone. But Father, I pray that your work has been evident in our hearts, maybe different areas, different aspects depending on the situation, the individual. But I pray that you've had a very clear piercing of the intents of our heart. Lord, that you have encouraged and refreshed, renewed our perspective, reignited the fact that we have purpose. Lord, give us a passion. It's so easy to become discouraged you're all angry and frustrated with all the different things in life that catch us by surprise. But God, help us to step back just like Paul and, and be thrilled to announce genuinely, I think myself happy. Hold on. You're probably thinking differently, but I think myself happy. Let me share with you why God's cleansed me. God cares for me no matter what comes. He's there to help. And I can obtain this help from His hand. God has called me. Lord, forgive us, break us, bend us. Help us, Lord. Heads up and eyes are closed. I'm not